So AGTC is a publicly traded company, so I, I ask you to refer to our public statements filed with the SEC. We are a gene therapy company that has multiple near-term data readouts in ophthalmology. This is an exciting time to be with AGTC and think about the future. We've got three different programs in the clinic which are all going to read out in 2019 and early 2020. Uh, it's something we've been preparing for for a number of years, and we're all just thrilled to be at this point in our development. We are a company that's very, very based on technology. We were founded by five virologists, so they're all, we're very focused on exactly how the AAV vector works, how to put it together to customize it to the patient, how to manufacture it in the most efficient way and get to the end point, which we're all uh, interested in, which is helping patients' lives. And this is our patient slide, and many people say, why, why do you have a patient slide or patient advocacy slide so uh, near the top of your deck? And it's because that is what drives us every day, is thinking about these patients with blinding disorders that are having difficulties in their life, that are having difficulties in education, selecting where they live, selecting their job. And so keeping the patient in mind, we think, is uh, very important, even at an early stage of a development. And I'll give you just one example of that. Uh, we have had close relationships with the Acromacore patient advocacy group for many years. So these are patients with achromatopsia, one of the indications we're working on that I'll talk about. And we went to their conferences and we were talking to them about things we were doing in the mice studies and the, in the non-human primate studies. And one thing we learned is that they weren't as concerned about visual acuity as we thought they would be. They're all legally blind. So we thought that was the number one concern they had. The number one concern they had is light sensitivity. They would not be able to stand where I'm standing right now with these two bright lights shining full on me. And so what we did is we developed a test with one of our principal investigators to quantify light sensitivity in these patients. And it's actually going to be one of our clinical endpoints. We're using it in our clinical trial. And the patients are thrilled that we're going to give them feedback on their number one concern. So this is why we believe staying close to your patients, interacting with the patient advocacy groups, learning what really matters to them helps you drive your clinical development and bring a product that's going to make a difference in their lives. So this is our product pipeline, and today I'm really only going to talk about the top of this chart, the three programs that are in the clinic. But we do have a program in optogenetics that we're filing an IND this year, and many preclinical programs that we're going to be making announcements about at our May uh, conference call. So if you're interested in the next set of programs that are going to come into the clinic, please tune in in May to that conference call. So these are the uh, milestones for those clinical programs I just talked about. In early April, we announced we'd completed enrollment to the dose escalation for one of our chromatopsia programs, and that we'd fully enrolled the uh, XLRP program, and that we are on track to complete the dose escalation for the A3 program. And so what that sets us up to is with certainty, since we know when we dose these patients, we have certainty about when we're going to be releasing data in the second half of this year and the first half of 2020. So let's talk about these clinical programs in a little bit more detail. So chromatopsy, again, focusing on what does this mean to the patient. The patient um, experiences an inability to read. Uh, if you have 2200 vision and legally blind, that means you can't read the top E. You can barely read the top E on an eye chart. That's what being legally blind means. But what really matters to these patients, as I said, is the light sensitivity. So what they're trying to utilize to, to have vision is just their rods. Well, rods can't function in any kind of light at all. So they wear very heavy glasses, tinted contacts, and it really kind of impacts their social ability. Their, think about playing sports as a kid or being on the playground at, at recess. It makes a huge difference in their lives. Also, these patients, it's a pretty prevalent disease, and that's another strategic decision that AGTC made, was to go after, yes, orphan indications, but orphan indications with more substantial patient populations. And there's about 28,000 patients with achromatopsia in the U.S. and the EU. 
So this is kind of an overview of what, what's really happening with these patients. So when you, when you have vision, a photon of light enters your eye, and your eye, this very ex exquisite organ, turns that uh, light energy into electrical en energy that your brain then recognizes as vision. Well, in a chromatopsia, the light cannot enter the cone cells because it, they can't get through a channel. They're missing a, a protein that allows a channel. So if light can't get into the cell, the cell can't create the electrical signal, and you don't have vision. So that's what's going on here. And so we're doing simple gene replacement, gene augmentation, gene therapy. And this is a little cartoon of our vector. So we're using an engineered vector that does a very good job at transducing primate cells, uh, photoreceptors. And then we're using a promoter, an en another engineered promoter, that we've designed specifically to make sure we're transducing all three types of cones in a primate. This is very, very important in ophthalmology. Primates are the only pr uh, mammals that have three types of cones. So if we designed a promoter in a mouse, we wouldn't be sure if it would work in a primate in all three cone types. So this is very important work to be done to lay the groundwork for success. We also have proprietary access to an animal model of this disease. It's a naturally occurring dog model at the University of Pennsylvania. So once again, we were able to work with a larger animal model and really understand dosing and what the phenotype looked like and time course of the disease. Very important before moving into the clinic. And then again, we did our targeting work in primates. So we made sure the capsid could transduce those cells. We made sure this special promoter could get to all the cones. And in ophthalmology gene therapy, if you're not doing this fine level of targeting work in primates, you may be bringing the complete wrong product into the, into the clinic. So we are in the middle of a phase one, two. Um, as I talked about, it's a typical dose escalation and then an expansion cohort. So in the B3 program, there's two different genes that cause the exact same clinical uh, phenotype. In the B3 program, we're in, uh, now dosing that, escalation, that expansion group. In the A3 program, we're in the last cohort of the escalation portion. Moving on to XLRP. So XLRP is another quite prevalent um, orphan ophthalmology indication, about 20,000 patients in the US and EU. But the mechanism of action is completely different. Uh, this disease affects both your rods and your cones. It typically affects the rods first for reasons that are not quite understood. And so it creates that kind of uh, stereotypical tunnel vision where you lose your peripheral vision first and your central vision last. Um, and it's a disease that's really devastating to the patients because they, they know that they have retinitis pigmentosa. Many times they don't know they have the specific type of RP we're working on, but they know they have RP, and they know that what that means is every single day their vision gets worse. Every single day. And so we talk to patients at the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and at whatever stage of vision loss they're, they're at, all they, want to say, all they want, all they're asking for from us as developers is, can you just make, let me maintain what I have now? I know you're probably not going to be able to get me back so I can see like a normal individual, but I, I want to maintain at least the vision I have, whether that's just a little bit of central vision, whether that's hand motion. They just want to know that it's not going to decline over time. So again, it's important to work with patients and understand what their expectations are. Are their expect, you know, because if their expectations were, could they get back to their vision as a nine-year-old? Maybe not. But this uh, in, in their interacting with patients is, is is just critical. So again, here we go. Uh, the disease mechanism here is that they're in rods and cones. There's a protein that kind of transports other proteins in between the inner and outer segments of uh, photoreceptors, and it doesn't work in this case. So you can't complete that visual cycle. In this specific indication, we're using the same engineered capsid because it's still photoreceptors we're trying to get to, but it's a different promoter um, to be able to make sure we're expressing in both rods and cones. And we've specifically engineered this gene to minimize uh, potentials for mutation since it has a very large repeat region. 
Same kind of trial, we have announced we've fully enrolled this trial and we'll be releasing data at the end of this year. Again, really exciting time for the company. And I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes about what's behind the development of these programs. And so, first of all, as you've heard me talk about engineering the capsid for the right cells, engineering the promoter to make sure it worked in all the cones in, in primates, thinking about the gene cassette in, XP, in XLRP where you need to make sure that you eliminate the repeat region. I'm going to talk about manufacturing in a minute. Formulation for ophthalmology is actually pretty important because what it is you can inject in the eye you have to be very careful about. And then vector administration, that physical delivery is quite important. So this um, line here that I've talked about is something we're very proud about, about the, uh, at the company. As I said, we were started by five virologists. We feel we really understand these vectors and how to put them together and how each of these components need to be specifically designed and put together correctly to get that best benefit for the patient. Again, uh, speaking to the specific needs of the patient and the phenotype of each indication. And then the importance of customization. So I talked a little bit about that promoter. And you can see here, I don't know if this pointer works. It doesn't look like it does. On the top, your top right, uh, you can see a standard promoter and you can't see any green. So that means there's no cell expression with a standard promoter in a primate eye. The bottom there shows a whole bunch of green, lots of lighting up of the cones and expression in a primate eye. So that's the importance of testing in primates and doing customization. The other side of the slide shows the importance of the capsids in testing in primates. Because what you see here in red is that engineered capsid we're working with and how much expression that supports in a primate eye. Below that, um, in the lower two, are two capsids that are typically used in academic labs in mice. They work fantastically in mice, but they don't work so well in primates. If you did this exact same experiment in a mouse, it would be flipped. The ones at the bottom would look better. The one at the top would work, look worse. This is the importance of understanding the dynamics of wh what you're working with. Manufacturing. There's been a lot of talk about this meeting in manufacturing. We've been working on this since our inception, again, the virologists in, in our history. And we've had seven successful INDs across multiple indications early in our uh, history. We worked on alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. We've worked on LCA2. We've worked on the, the products that we have in the clinic. Never been put on hold for a CMC issue. Never had any adverse event with our CMC process. And we're in suspension, in stirred tanks. Uh, we are not relying on plasmids. We have developed very quantitative analytics because we know that's what's going to be needed as we move forward. So this is a true strength of ours. And if anyone is interested in our manufacturing system and being in stirred tank suspension with no uh, animal-derived products with ready-made analytics, yeah, give us a call. Um, and on top of that, it's a very productive system. Uh, out of 25 liters, we're currently getting about 4,000 doses uh, for ophthalmology, obviously. That would be more, more around 400 or, or 100 for more uh, IV delivery. Um, but our pivotal process, we, over which we've made some rec uh, improvements over the last year and a half, is actually 10x that. So we'd get 40,000 ophthalmology doses out of 25 liters. And this uh, correlates for us, we wouldn't make that much, right? But it still correlates to us to a dramatic decrease into the cost of goods sold. Um, and it's all due to the density of the cells in a stirred tank reactor that we can get to and the efficiency of our helper virus system. So standard team slide, we've got a wonderful, fully um, outfitted team with extensive experience across ophthalmology as well as gene and cell therapy, so a very experienced group of people. Um, and again, milestones coming up this year, lots of data being uh, read out. We've set ourselves up to be able to get through all of this data over multiple indications without having to access the markets again. We have a strong balance sheet. So it's an exciting time for the industry as a whole and an extremely exciting time at AGTC. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>